the Sermon on the Mount or the teachings that Jesus gave when he went up on the mountaintop that was unique and distinctive from anything else that they'd ever heard was the fact that Jesus spoke as one having authority that if we look at the last chapter of the verses that are usually contained in what we call the Sermon on the Mount then we see that in chapter 7 at the end it says that the people were astonished at his doctrine because he spoke as one not like the scribes and the Pharisees who said it is written or would compare scripture with scripture but rather spoke as one saying I say unto you there's no doubt that everything contained in chapter 5, 6, and 7 is what Jesus said, I say unto you. Jesus is making a complete break from everything that's gone before in one way. He's exercising his authority over all that is being said. He's saying, this is from me and I am saying it. So whenever you look at this, you look at it as being Jesus said, and then you have the opportunity or the choice to respond how you will, the way you will. Now, Jesus did add a criteria to what he said, because at the end of this, quote, Sermon on the Mount, he said that the person who did those things that he was saying to them would be likened unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock, that whenever the storms of life would come or anything would come, that nothing would affect that house to cause it to crash or to fall down. But he said that those people who didn't do those things that he said would be likened to a foolish man that sadly built his house upon sand. And when the rains came and when the storms of life hit, it fell. And how great was the destruction thereof. Jesus doesn't give us an option on what he said to do. Jesus commanded us to do it. Jesus doesn't simply make a pie-in-the-sky idea and say, this is my religious theme, this is where I want you to go someday in a sweet by and by, or sometimes in the hereafter, when you feel like it, when all of the wealth of the knowledge of the Word of God has come inside you, you're going to become this. No, Jesus was speaking to everyday people. He was speaking to practical people. He started by bringing his disciples to him and said, I say unto you and the people heard also because they were there and he spoke unto them and said I say unto you when Jesus addresses the Sermon on the Mount he's speaking to you and he says I say unto you what you do with that if you interpret it is not what Jesus said if you spiritualize it or you somehow make it allegorical or you make it into a simile or a metaphor or some type of oh well the Jews didn't speak directly in those days they were making some kind of like little story out of it so that we could make it fit where we want to go that's not what Jesus said literally these devotions are showing and revealing bluntly what Jesus said so that there is no doubt the only question is, what is Jesus saying to you? In verse 11, Blessed are you when men shall revile you, and persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you falsely, for my sake. Jesus doesn't mince words here by telling you you're going to have a wonderful life. Jesus doesn't pretend that there's an abundant, wonderful, peaceful existence that's going to be yours, like a garden that's protected from all the world, and you've got stiff walls, and you've got perfect sunshine, and you've got only the right amount of rain, and that you're going to grow like some little carefully cultivated little flower that doesn't have any thorns and that it's just going to be beautiful like this one or that one. But he says, no. Blessed are you when men shall revile you. Because they will. Because for his name's sake, you will suffer persecution. 
Jesus said that in the world we would have persecution. That's obvious. He said in the world we would have tribulation. That's obvious. In the world you will have all the normal circumstances that the world goes through. That's obvious and he'll be with you. But we're discovering there's something more that Jesus said in verse 11. When they revile you and persecute you and say all manner, not some, but all manner of evil against you falsely. Now think about that. Are there things in your life that are true that people confront you with? Do you have a bad attitude? Do you have a bad action? Do you have a bad intention? Do you do things wrongly because it's you doing it and not Jesus? Then you're not blessed. Because for his name's sake, if you are arranging your life, then Jesus treats you as his if you are constantly asking God to forgive you, to cleanse you, to make you into his image then he claims you as his own. Then he stands as your defense. He stands as your righteousness. He stands as your justification. He stands as your redemption. He stands as your salvation. He acts on your behalf so that you are not the guilty party. He has taken that guilt upon himself for his name's sake. So why are you blessed? How can you be blessed? Because all that they're going to heap upon you is because of him and not you. So be careful that it's because of his name's sake and that you admit the truth when you make mistakes. Because the reality of verse 11 says if they do it falsely and they say all manner of evil against you falsely and they revile you falsely and they persecute you falsely because of his name's sake. Jesus is the reason, not for the season, but Jesus is the reason why there is that hostility at times towards Christians. There, Jesus is the reason why there's hostility at you when you are doing the right thing. Because Jesus reveals whether or not it's false or whether it's true. And so if you're finding yourself in truth of what Jesus said to do, then they are accusing you falsely and reviling you and persecuting you. But more than that, the people at that time, they knew that if they went against what the scribes and the Pharisees said, if they did choose to follow Jesus as he said, follow me, if they chose a different direction, then they knew they could be subject to stoning from their religious leaders. They knew they could be subject to Roman law which it looked as though Jesus was coming as a king of kings to free Israel from Roman law, and yet he didn't. So, Jesus is making a distinction between a separation of what religion of his day had said and claimed that he was going to be, and what he came and did and be fulfilled in what he is. So, you were blessed by him in him and through him as you find yourself being accused falsely because the reality is the sad part is if you do what Jesus says literally the world will hate you and Jesus says that later that the world will hate you he's saying they will revile you he's saying the world will persecute you he's saying Count the cost. Be real. Know that your salvation isn't a free ride. Know that choosing to have the name of Jesus, having the persona of being called a Christian or Christ-like, isn't simply a religious idea or simile or simil similitude of you being and acting like a religious person, but rather, if you are doing as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, not only are you going to be falsely accused, they're going to persecute you and come at you and contradict you and make you into anything that they can and gnash on you because they can't have someone do and accept and believe what Jesus said because it goes contrary to all religious law. 
it is the one thing that separates Christianity, if it's like Christianity that Jesus said, separates it from all religion of Christianity. Because it is a faith-based, factual relationship of God working in you, doing what He would to accomplish through you. There can be no difference between what Jesus said to do and what you do. Because Jesus said, do this. And if you don't, if you won't, then your house, your life, your works, your determination, your religion is a house of sand. And I'm sorry, it's false. Hmm. But you know what? What if? I don't know. What if? What if God says what he means? What if Jesus means what he says? What if he made it so simple that little children could read this? and do as Jesus said? What if it's as easy as read, see, and do? Hmm. Can't be that easy. Could it be that simple? To just do as you're told? Except you become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. Aren't children told what to do, when to do it, how to do it? Have you ever had children? God has, and you're one of them. Will you do what Jesus said? The choice is yours to make. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. You may not feel like you're blessed, but it will prove that you're doing what Jesus said.